Hi there budding psychologists, welcome to this video on the debates in psychology. I'm going to run through lots of the debates in psychology, drawing in a few examples from research along the way to illustrate them. So what is a debate? It's about a discussion uh, on either side, there's kind of an opinion. So it tends to be versus nature, nature versus nurture, free will versus determinism, reductionism versus holism, individual versus situational. Then you've got usefulness of research, uh, ethical considerations, socially sensitive research and psychology as a science. Right, nature versus nurture debate. We'll start with nurture because they usually start with nature. Nurture is the idea that a particular behaviour has come around because maybe it's something that you've learned from the environment that you're in. So you might learn to behave a particular way because of your upbringing, let's say. Nature, on the other hand, considers the reason for a particular behaviour is largely because of your genes. So that's to say a particular behaviour is innate within you. So you would have very little control about your choice of performing a particular behaviour. Now, another way to kind of illustrate um, this might be with the example of intelligence. We might say that we're predisposed to have a certain level of intelligence. It's innate within us. It's part of our nature. We might do lots of research, let's say, on twins to illustrate the fact that, oh, look, one twin's intelligent, the other twin's intelligent. It must be something genetic that's responsible for that particular relationship. The thing that you kind of can't afford with the nature-nurture debate is you have to be interactionist in a sense. It's about nature versus nurture because environments always going to play a role. There's never 100% concordance really with any particular kind of behaviour that we're looking at. It's also true when we look at different areas in psych. For example, we've got aggression, um, sexuality, massive nature nurture debate, mental illness, big nature nurture debate and personality nature nurture debate there too. All right, next one is free will versus determinism. Now this bait centres around essentially the element of control and who has control. Free will side of the debate is going to say yes, I have control. Things are in my choosing. I determine my own destiny. Whereas determinism on the other side says, oh, sorry, you don't have control. Or if you have control, you have very little control. And that's, as human beings, kind of concerning to us, the idea that we don't have any control. So we often ask lots of questions about, well, do we have control um, over our behaviour? And you might, you know, get a man who's really excited because he got a particular job and he was like, I really wanted this job. And it's like, well, did you really want it? Was it really your choice? Or was it the choice of your brain chemistry that you were born with? And it was genetic and it was built in, it was already fixed, it was already determined, as with your family situation that you were born into and socialised in a particular way. Okay, next one is the reductionism versus holism debate. This tends to be a tricky one for students to grasp and it centres around a particular quote, I think it was by Aristotle who said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That is to say, how do we understand behaviour? Do we break it down into small bits or do we look at the entire person, the entire behaviour? Reductionism, if we were looking at, for example, mental illness, might say, yes, we'll focus on particular neurotransmitters, maybe dopamine or serotonin, or, okay, we'll look at particular hormones. We might look at, let's say, the role of cortisol in um, depression, which a lot of research does. But to be more holistic with that piece of research, we'd have to say, oh, hold on a minute. No, we need to look at the whole. We need to look at how hormones impact mental illness. But we also need to take into consideration that there may be some role that the family or the upbringing might have paid for a particular person in terms of why they're suffering from mental illness at the moment. Added to that, we're also going to consider the fact that there might be some kind of neurochemical chemical component of it. And we also want to consider other things to do with the brain, maybe some kind of brain abnormality. So holistic is taking the whole picture. Reductionism is reducing it down to very, very small kind of quantifiable things that we can measure to determine particular types of behaviour. So reductionism, you'll come on to, we'll see later, we might argue it's a little bit more scientific. Okay, next one is the individual versus the situation. So a big one here, I'm going to draw in some nice research from social psychology as well, um, just to help illustrate what this particular debate is about. So the question here is, are internal or external factors responsible for behaviour? That's to say, am I the cause of my behaviour? Am I responsible or is something else to blame? Now, Milgram did loads and loads of research into obedience and this was really the big question. Who is responsible for a particular act? Is it the individual or is it the situation? He was really thinking about this idea of are there bad apples? Are people inherently bad? Or is there some other explanation? This is kind of research born after World War II, looking at this idea that the Nazis were somehow different in some way. Now, what Milgram found was actually, no, it's all about the situation. The situations a person is placed in 
is to a large extent responsible for the behaviour that then is the outcome. So we can't really say that there are bad apples when any situation could turn a person bad. Philip Zimbardo in the Stanford Prison Experiment, really famous piece of research, found exactly the same thing. This idea that, oh, hold on a minute, is it prisons that make people act in kind of certain ways? Or is it that, you know, kind of prisons contain bad people and they're going to act like that? And Zimbardo found the same thing. It's the situation that creates the individual, not the individual themselves. So this idea of evil being inherent is, is largely untrue. Next one is the usefulness of research. Now, of course, psychology is supposed to benefit society in some way, so it'd be nice that it was useful. So it's kind of three layers here that we look at. One, does is the research going to tell us something we didn't know? Is it going to undermine something we did know? And also, is it going to benefit society in some way? So if you think back, you've probably come across at some point um, Albert Bandura's um, SLT research um, on aggression. That helped us massively because... Up until that time, we thought that watching TV wasn't that bad. Watching aggressive acts were actually good for us. They were cathartic. But Bandura found the opposite and said, actually, watching aggression is a bit dodgy. We might want to monitor children watching these aggressive acts in case they model them. So we, we knew something new. We undermined something we thought we knew. And we benefited society in some way. Next one is the ethical considerations in research. Now, we could go on for hours about this, and I'm sure you know your ethics quite well. Um, the kind of things that you're going to have to look at for a piece of research when you're looking at ethics are things like, you know, dece deception, confidentiality, the kind of idea that you're having to debrief participants at the end of a piece of research. This is all a balancing act. Sometimes it's okay to deceive if it's important for the research. Of course, the BPS are going to weigh up whether or not you can do a particular piece of research, depending upon the ethics involved in this idea of well, do the ends justify the means essentially asking the question of is it worth it okay nick linked to ethics is um socially sensitive um research which is particularly prominent within psychology so socially sensitive research is all about you might take a piece of psychological research that might accidentally have an impact on people in society who weren't even involved in the piece of research so the implications are outside of the research situation so you might uh, do a piece of research suggesting that actually mothers should be staying at home with their children for a long period of time after giving birth because if they don't it's going to have a negative impact on the attachment of that child and that might have been your research finding but that's going to have implications for wider society because you know you might feel get, uh, as a mother that you have to stay at home maybe you want to go back to work and you can't go back to work because as soon as you go back to work you might have people at work saying well you should be at home you're not going to be able to attach to your child in some way and this is actually what happened. This is bulb is essentially an assertion that, you know, the mother needs to be around for the child to form an attachment. And that's socially sensitive because it has wider implications for society at whole. Right. Psychology as a science. Now, this is a really interesting one. Again, it's huge. And this is the idea that when we think of science, we tend to think of the traditional sciences, kind of biology, chemistry, physics, psychology used to get called a soft subject. Now people are saying it's a science. But a science doesn't have to involve test tubes and, and microscopes. You don't need some crazy guy in a white coat with kind of crazy wild hair to be considered a science. You've just got to meet certain features and psychology sometimes might meet those features. Other times, however, it might not. So we're talking about things like objectivity, falsifiability, replicability, the idea of paradigms, and this idea of, well, should psychology be a science? And it is a very, very big debate. So objectivity is the idea that, is what I'm doing objective? Am I kind of coming to any conceivable kind of fact, if you like? The problem in psychology is a lot of what we do tends to be considered subjective. For example, the use of questionnaires in research, uh, even things like observations could be considered subjective. Falsifiability is the idea that if you're going to come up with a particular thing, a hypothesis, for example, that you want to test, you have to be able to prove it false in order for it to be scientific. Now, this renders someone like Freud useless because the idea of the id how could we essentially go out and say, well, that's not true because, you know, Freud would say, well, there's always some id involved somewhere. So falsifiability, important feature of flight. The next one is replicability. This idea of you've got to be able to repeat what you've done. And one of the reasons is for reliability. 
uh, problematically in psychology though case studies we can't ethically really repeat a case study it would be entirely impractical to repeat a case study final one is the idea of paradigms paradigms are a kind of set of assumptions that a particular science might share this is a massive problem for psychology because we come at things from so many different angles maybe it's from the biological or from the cognitive or from the psychodynamic so we don't share a single set of assumptions in psychology which is perhaps the biggest reason we're not a science thank you so much for watching that was a massive run through please be sure to subscribe on youtube for lots more videos coming up in the future